and I have to give a disclaimer. We are a very dog friendly company and we have five dogs in the office right now. So if you hear barking, that's just the, that's just the dogs. So what I'm going to discuss with you all today is orphan and abandoned wells and uh, particularly the what we call the closing window for plugging ancient orphan oil wells. And um, this is something that our company, Cameron Energy, you see our logo down here, um, that we focus heavily on. And it's something that's starting to get discussed on a broader level, um, you know, in Harrisburg. And But it, we need to pick up the pace. We need to educate a lot of people. And that's why I'm here today. So I'm the envir environmental care coordinator for our company. Um, as Dr. B said, I was a graduate in 2009. Uh, one of the very cool jobs that I did as I worked as a hydrologic technician in 2010. And then another really cool um, job was a, I was a wetland delineator and wetland biologist uh, for a private engineering firm. And uh, I've, my focus has always been around water. So, um, and I, that has not changed in my role as environmental care coordinator. So at Cameron, we have a, uh, a zero, you know, NOV policy. And what that means is notice of violation with the Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, we've achieved that goal the last several years uh, that I've been in charge. And some of those roles include erosion and sedimentation. For any GGE students, you need to wrap your mind around erosion and sedimentation and, and what you do and how you comply with it, how you do design and implement those uh, controls. Um, I'm also the surface owner point of contact. And what that means is I interact with other owners where we may be drilling, where we may be plugging, where we are active. And uh, that's a critical role that I play. And I run our GPS and GIS mapping department of one, that is me alone. And um, I do all of our new well layout. And I also manage our forest. We have uh, about 4,000 acres of private surface forest. Um, and then one of the big jobs that I do, maybe half my time or maybe a little less, just depending on what I have on my workload, is I locate orphan and abandoned wells. So a little bit more background on Cameron. So we're a family owned company and um, we're located in Warren County. This is our website. I don't think I linked it, but uh, if anybody wants to visit our website, feel free to do. We employ about 40 people. Um, we're a, well, I guess we're a small fish, but we're maybe a big fish in a small pond in the area for conventional producers. Um, we operate safely um, with about 1800 conventional wells. And what a conventional well is, it, one of the easy ways to think of it is it's shallow. It's, um, it, it's a much smaller well, it's a much smaller impact than the convention, unconventional that is a horizontal well. And that's really what came to Pennsylvania in uh, about 2010, 2011, and really picked up through the mid 2000 you know, teens. And uh, we are not an unconventional company. We own no unconventional wells. So we have one of the most active plugging programs and that's what I'm gonna focus on. And um, I, I'm very proud of our plugging program. So what is well plugging? So this is the this is my definition. It's not the verbatim DEP definition, but it's the decommissioning of depleted or abandoned oil and gas wells, which is typically done with Portland cement. And what we do is we pull everything out, we get to obtainable bottom, and we seal it off the oil and gas bearing sand layers uh, with that Portland cement. And uh, that can be a very difficult task at times. And you need very specialized equipment for this. Um, we have all that at Cameron. We have um, many service rigs and rig tools. We have dozers and excavators. And we have a cementer. We actually have two cementers now. Um, and you need cement, you need water, and you need a lot of hard work. Uh, a lot of these wells are out in the middle of nowhere. There's no roads. Um, and these are very ancient and dilapidated wells. 
the DP estimates it to cost about $18,000 a piece to plug a oil well, shallow oil well. So, um, and our most expensive was around $50,000. So you can imagine there's, there's a high level of variability. And I think that that estimate is fairly accurate from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Te Protection. So uh, since I started with Cameron 2014 to uh, 2021, we've plugged 123 wells. This includes some previously active wells. So these were depleted or there was something wrong with them and we plugged them and we're responsible for those wells. So um, we, uh, and but a lot of them, the lion's share of them were orphan and abandoned wells. These are wells that, um, you know, were drilled in the 1800s, 19, early 1900s. So, um, and a little bit, you know, that maybe that doesn't sound like a big number. That is a big number to a company like ours and to the Commonwealth because the DEP recently cited that their orphan and abandoned well plugging program in uh, 2017, 18, 19, they only plugged a total of 25 wells and we have thousands of these wells to plug. So every well plugged is one less that we have to deal with tomorrow. So, um, so I touched on some of the required equipment. These are pictures of our, um, of our service rigs and some of our equipment and it's very specialized. And we have, uh, we have nine rigs and eight of them are service rigs. We have a drill rig that's in here. Sometimes we have to move a drill rig to, to ream the hole back out in order to get to the attainable bottom to properly plug the well. In the center picture here at the top, that's our new cementer there. We're very proud of that. We just purchased that. And that allows us to uh, have some savings with plugging the wells so we can drive that cost down so we can plug more wells. And it's really important to note that the PADP, they, you know, they contract this work to plug those wells, but they don't have the equipment. It's the oil and gas owners, it's the operators, and it's the service industry that has that. And we can't lose that or we lose the ability to plug wells. So we're going to talk mostly about orphan, but I want to touch on, again, these are my definitions and it's orphan versus abandoned. And when I say orphan wells, I'm talking about really ancient wells. These are drilled in 1800s. And, uh, you know, the picture in the top right there, that's Colonel Drake and his well that was drilled in 1859. And, you know, the oil and gas you know, industry was founded here in the Keystone state of Pennsylvania. And, these are wells that are, you know, for the most part, lost to time. And they've been, you know, mostly ignored, although we have done lots of plugging as an industry. And um, I think we deserve the credit for that. And, uh, but there's still many more wells to find. And then an abandoned well would be something I would say is a more modern well, someone that took oil and gas, we can find records, we have a permanent number, we know what an, the operator is. And I'm not going to focus so much on abandoned wells, but, you know, they, they overlap, um, if you will. We've, we've plugged aban someone else's abandoned wells, and we plug our own active wells so they don't become abandoned someday. And um, so this, these orphan wells that we're going to speak of, there, there's 100,000 of them to maybe over a half a million of them left in the Commonwealth. And again, we're mostly ignoring them. And it's not something we can ignore forever. And I'm going to show you many reasons why we can't ignore it. These, uh, the picture in the top left and the picture in the bottom right, these are two wells that we are planning to plug this year. These are wells that I located. And I think I even sent you some pictures of these, uh, Dr. B. And uh, we're, we're planning on plugging these. These will be a part of a, a fairly big program of you know, 10 or more wells that we'll plug of various condition. So some of the different things that you find with orphan wells, I mean, that's pretty well camouflaged, but that's an orphan well. And you can see that, you can see that this hemlock tree has grown through it over time. And, you know, this is starting to pull that well apart. And that, that's a problem. So it's, it's nature at work. And these, like I said, a lot of these wells have been lost to time. Um, you know, these were drilled many generations ago. 
here's a well. This was a part of a program we were going to do last year, but of course, COVID hit. And this is, you know, within the stream bank of a, you know, that's a high quality trout stream. You can see that that is, that is going to be in the trout stream and that's going to become harder to plug as time goes by. This is just upstream of that, that's the same stream. This is going to be a very, very big project. You can see that the stream has eroded the bank where the well was most likely drilled at the time. And it's bent over from years of getting pounded by this stream and floodwaters. And that is going to be a very difficult plug job. We are going to have to build a bridge in there. I'm gonna to have to work very closely with the PADEP to get that properly plugged, but that is on our radar to plug that one. So as I said, they're deteriorating and it's really, they're rusting away. And you can see, I circled in the center here, this is rusting away. And if that rusts away and, and the rest of this gives way, all that pumping mechanism is gonna to fall to the bottom of that hole. And when that old you know, rods and tubing fall, they are gonna crumple in the hole and you're gonna drive the price of your plugging operation up. It's time for that well to be plugged. So here's another one where everything was taken out of the hole. Again, this is going to be a very difficult plug job. This was right in the middle of a bush. This was very hard to find. This one, I, I only went on just a little bit of surface evidence and I have some maps that I use. These are maps and all these dots on the map. Those are most likely either already plugged or orphaned and abandoned wells. And this was one of those wells. I knew that there was a well there. We had to dig to find it and we found it. Some, and another instance of that happened, you can see in the, on the left side here, I'm pointing to well nine and there was no evidence of this well. This well was in a uh, road to a camp here and um, we ended up finding it. And I have a video of it uh, of finding it. I don't think there's any foul language, but I, excuse me if there is. You can see it gassing there in the center. That's methane coming out of the, the open well, well bore. There's very little of this, little evidence of this well. So how great is the explosive risk with uh, that, the teeth of that excavator striking a casing with the open flowing well? Uh, not very much. Uh, there, you know, there's, you know, it's very moist there. There, there would be very little risk in that instance. It's a very specific atmospheric pressure that it becomes, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I said it's a stinky. You could smell it. I mean, and really, I was probably more smelling the oil down the hole. So, but there's very little risk with the, the exploding with the excavator. But there's real. There was no other way to find it. You know, we had to dig up the side of the road here. And so when you were chasing this well, about what area did you have an idea that you might find the casing in, like 10 feet by 10 feet or 100 feet by 100 feet? Or... I, I think I was a lot closer than that. I, it was probably more like five, or eight feet by eight feet or five feet by five feet. I could find the old infrastructure that was pointing me in the right direction. I had the old map and there was a little bit of sheen in the water there, um, but very, very minimal. So I knew it was right there. Uh, we got lucky and we found it. And that now that well is decommissioned. It is properly plugged now. And um, that was a part of a plugging project two years ago, a, a fairly big plugging project. Nope. This is another example of human activity. So these wells were drilled again, a long, long time ago before this power line was there. And these are the main legs of power coming out of the Kinzu Reservoir. And there was there's two wells that are directly under the same leg right here on this power line. And I had to coordinate with the power company for when that was turned off. And we had a very small window to plug those wells. And that was uh, last year this time. 
we set up on them with two rigs um, that you can see one of the rigs here. That's that well right there. And that is our oldest rig. That's a 70 year old rig. And um, we call it pokey and pokey gets out there in the, the tough to reach places because it, it's on tracks. So, um, but we plugged two wells at the same time the week before COVID hit. And um, that was quite the project because, you know, when the power is getting turned back on, we had to rig down or, I mean, we would, it would be a very unsafe scenario. So here's some more examples of human activity. And um, this is a well that I found and people have filled it with rocks and that's going to be very difficult to get down the bottom. You also see that it's experiencing a lot of deterioration here at the surface that is also happening down the hole. That is going to be a very expensive plug job at some time in the future. Um, we have, uh, this is an example of deteriorated casing that we pulled out of a well and you can see all this casing and the point of casing is it's casing off the surface water. And when you have that deteriorating casing, you, you get something called bridges, which are hard to get through to get down the hole to get to obtainable bottom and to properly plug the well. And the other thing that's happening when you have that deteriorating casing is you're having commingling of fresh water with your oil and gas layers. So methane's getting in the water, oil's getting in the water, um, or it's coming out in the surface, or um, it, it's also going to the, the oil and gas bearing sands and it's making the clays in those sands swell and it's ruining any productivity in the future as well for, for those sand layers. There's more deteriorating and collapsing casing. You can see, I mean, th this is a piece of casing right here. It's deteriorated to a point where it's barely sheet metal. Here's a video. This is, I'll give you a little bit of background. This was a volunteer plug job that we had. Um, uh, one, of our, um, one of our employees found this well and it was burping oil and a significant amount of oil. And it was burping it right into the uh, Tynesa Creek. And we volunteered to plug this and we knew this was a problem well. And the longer you leave these problem wells, the, I mean, it's, it's pretty apparent, it's pretty obvious what's going on here. Um, you know, we're having surface and, you know, subsurface pollution going on. And so we volunteered to plug this. And here's a little bit of that flowing oil coming out. You know, we are circ we're doing two things here. We're agitating the hole, but we're circulating here. Um, and you have to clean the hole out with water. We collect all that. We collect the oil and, you know, we do the best to be as environmentally responsible as possible. So. This is a very difficult location. We're surrounded by a stream on three sides here. And there's almost no room, as you can see, like right on the other side of the rig. You can't really tell, it doesn't give it justice, but the, there, this is a tight location, very difficult. There are no road access. We had to take all their tracked vehicles a mile back to plug this well. Tyler, there's a question in the chat. Can you see the chat or do you? Oh, I, can, I can. I cannot. I am sorry. No. Okay. Uh, you can yeah, read what it is, to you. Yeah. Could you read? I'm sorry. Um, it's from Dr. Schiappa. Yes. What do you do with the waste water and waste oil? Um, well, the, the waste oil, we try to collect that into tanks. And if it's a very little amount, we'll, we'll end up burning it. Um, or we put it in our collection tanks and you know, we, we dispose of it by sending it to a refinery. Um, we recycle all of our water that we can and, or we send it for treatment. Um, so we try to contain absolutely as much as possible. And, uh, you know, we, we, I think we do a very good job of that. I mean, we get surface inspections of these plug jobs as well. And we've not had any violations in regards to plugging activities. So is that, that answer, that's kind of a, it's a broad, but yeah, we try, we try to collect everything that we can, you know, the, so and I'm sorry, I didn't see that question. I was not ignoring it. Um, so the deteriorating, the downhole conditions, you know, we have all kinds of downhole conditions and this, this is pipe you can't, it's hard to see in this, but this 
pipe has separated and it fell and it twisted on itself when it fell. And the only way, you know, we hooked onto that with our rig and we pulled it up. And the only way to get that up, you know, out of the hole is to cut it. And that's a lot of work and that's very difficult. And this is, this is something that's going to become more common as that pipe rots and falls down the hole. We're going to have these issues. And we purchased, this is pokey again. This is very close to the, the well that we found in the road. It's a part of that same area. We did a lot of plugging in that area. Um, and uh, these are like jaws of life, rig shears, we call them. So we can't unscrew this pipe. We have to cut it apart. So we bought these hydraulic shears. I should should say that most of the wells that we're plugging, they range from about a thousand feet deep to two thousand feet deep. That's the lion's share of them. So those are coming out as joints of forty feet at a time. So it's it, it's quite the process, um, especially when you encounter difficult uh, situations such as that where you can't unscrew the pipe. You have to take the time to cut it. There's another example of something that fell and this was just left behind and it was very difficult to fish it and we were able to get it out of the hole. So here's some examples of that deterioration that's happening way below the surface. These are holes and as these holes continue to go around and erode, you know, anything below them is going to fall. Tyler, how do you plug it? Do you just put concrete in there? Yeah, like, you... so yeah, yeah. So. After we get everything out of the hole, um, we run new pipe back in. And we first, we typically um, run a three inch pipe or a four inch pipe down inside that casing so that when we plug it, we don't inadvertently shove oil and gas out into the aquifer because we're dealing with very old pipe. So we pull, pull everything out, we run the new pipe in, we run um, what we call a uh, uh, plugging string and then we run that all the way down to near bottom we get as close to attainable bottom as we get attainable bottom sometimes that's not all the way down but close and we run the we run water down we circulate the hole and then we run the cement down then the next day we come back and we tag it all we do is we hit that cement with that same tubing and make sure the cement is where we want it to be we do have a camera. Sometimes we run the camera, but uh, you know, any anything extra always adds time, always adds cost, and we cover all those layers with that Portland cement, and then um, then we you know we put pea gravel to surface once all the cement is in there, and then we monument it. We put a, a post with the a assigned API number. That's the active well or plugged well number. It's that's associated through the state. And that way that isn't lost in case there's a problem with it. And so we know where that well is. Does that answer it fully? Yeah, thank you. Okay. There's another chat question. Okay. A lot, of, I'm so a lot of wells that you plug, are they mainly near bodies of water? <laughs> That's actually a good question. Um, well, it's Pennsylvania, so we have lots of water. Um, but uh, there was, you know, when, when oil and gas first came around, after Colonel Drake uh, drilled his well, there's something called creekology. And the old timers, a lot of the time, would drill near streams um, and very close to streams because they believed that the oil would follow the stream. Um, but 
it's not all true. I mean, we, we plug on hilltops, we plug on side hills, we plug in fields, we plug in the woods, we plug near streams, we plug near, you know, bodies of water, but yeah. So yeah, we find a lot of them near water, unfortunately. I have a question too, Tyler. Yes. Um, so if you're plugging um, the holes with concrete, mm -hmm. how long do you expect the concrete to last? Well, um, so far we've had it, uh, you know, that's a, that's a tough question. I, I don't, I guess I don't know. I mean, I've only been plugging since 2014. Yeah. Um, so far we've had none of our uh, plugs that we've done recently fail. And sometimes they do, but uh, concrete's the best media that we've found cost effective um, and being able to do what you it need it to do. Um, but what I showed you in that video of rolling the hole with water. Um, if you didn't do that, the concrete would do something called honeycomb and that, that plug would fail and it would, it might fail immediately, but we, you know, yeah, that we, we hope that the concrete lasts as long as possible, but uh, you know, it's certainly, even if you have a failure, you're not going to have, you know, it's still decommissioned as best as we know how. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions? I know I'm covering a lot of material. I'm trying to keep everything in layman's terms as much as I can. Um, and, uh, you know, I have some more videos and some other stuff to show. So Tyler, again, this is, I yes. I had a question for you. When you took yes. this job, did you realize there would be this much hands-on work right at the rig? Um. Well, I, I don't typically work right at the rig, but uh, yeah, I would say that I was surprised at how you know, it's, a, it's a lot of hard work. Um, I certainly would work on the rig if I was asked to. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's a little surprising. You know, you, you have to get your boots, you have to pull your bootstraps up and you have to work hard. These Some of these are long days. And, you know, particularly with these ones way out in the middle of there, you, you know, when you start the job, you want to finish the job because that travel back and forth is, you know, is costs more money. And the more money we spend plugging, the better off the, everybody in the Commonwealth is. Right. Thanks. Yeah. This is another good example of deteriorating pipe. That's actually a miracle that that pipe was coming it got all the way to the surface before it fell. And if that falls again, that's going to, I'm going to cover a little bit uh, on a term called fishing. And when you go fishing, you're driving that cost way up and it makes it much more difficult to plug. Tyler, another question. Yes. A lot of the wells that you plug, are they, oh no, that was, would you say there is any significant environmental concerns with the abandonment of these wells? Well, yeah, the, um, my main concern is, is water resources, um, but there's also a methane uh, risk as well. Um, it, it, yeah, so th this is a serious problem. This needs, this needs address. It's been mostly ignored. Um, you know, I don't want to uh, um, make anything too political, but everybody needs to come to the table and discuss this and everybody needs to come to the table and start tackling this problem. Because even if we start plugging, you know, thousands of wells a year, you know, we have years of plugging at a thousand wells. I mean, you know, you know, half a million wells is a lot of wells. I want to um, comment in here, Tyler. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to add some perspective to that question. Yep. The, Orphan and abandoned wells are a massive, huge environmental concern. And Tyler Absolutely. has been yeah. describing that. The abandonment and plugging of the well, the plugging of the well and the closure, that is the solution to the environmental problem. And Dr. Hartman's question is, spoke to how much confidence do we have in the solution? And Tyler's response was essentially, we're doing the best that we can. We, we, we can't guarantee anything perfect, but we do know if it's not done correctly and you get a honeycomb, it's not quite the solution that you hoped it to be. But I just want to emphasize that the wells sitting out there, unplugged, 
rotting away, are releasing methane. They are commingling oil, gas, and methane. They are hazard to everything, including, of course, the possibility that once in a while, children fall down wells because they found this thing and they're playing with it and they're small enough to fit. Um, so there's even a physical hazard to an open well and that things that, and you know, uh, there's just so much to it, but anyone who's ever near a well should understand that that thing can kill them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, the, yeah. If they lose their cell phone or their keys down the well, they are never likely yeah. to see that cell phone or those keys again. You, you have a hole that's six inches wide and 2000 feet deep. And if yeah. you drop something down there, that is what Tyler is describing as going fishing. So yep. we have a huge environmental liability and Tyler and his company are working to reduce the environmental liability. Yeah. And, and, and work working very hard with the DEP, with the legislature. And um, we, we really want to find some better solutions and, um, you know, finding them and plugging them is, is the way to get out from under this environmental li liability. And the liability is only going up by the day. And, you know, these are wells um, to give you more historical perspective. You know, I keep saying late 1800s. The, these wells that I'm showing you pictures of, we fought World War I on the oil produced from these wells. You know, these are very old and um, there's no one that's going to be responsible for them, except, you know, local operators are volunteering. We're not the only ones volunteering, by the way, um, to plug these. And um, we need to find funds to plug them. You know, even if, even if we were get, we get zero reimbursement for plugging an orphan and abandoned well, zero money from anywhere, except out of our own pockets. Tell them and, a little bit, Tyler, about how we also fought World War II off of these wells. What, what yeah, we happened did. between World War I and World War II? Yeah, so, you know, yeah, a little more per perspective. And, and I really like the perspective because when you're standing there, you, you can think back how long that history is. Um, and between World War I and World War II, the U.S. shifted most of its production from Pennsylvania and Ohio and, and New York State to uh, to Texas, you know, Texas fields were discovered and we started fighting World War II, not only on our fields um, up here in Northwestern Pennsylvania, but also in Texas. And the Texas fields were a lot uh, more productive, um, you know, as an oil field um, or an oil well is in production, it is depleting. And um, a lot of our area was depleted by then. And the steel that was in the, those wells was more valuable to go to uh, battleships and aircraft than it was to pump oil. And uh, a lot of that was scrapped. And um, we have uh, two wells on one of the plugging projects I mentioned earlier for this year that have endured that scrapping likely around World War II and it's going to make them very difficult to plug. And, um, you know, sometimes you don't find any evidence like the one in the road. Sometimes you just find an open hole and that's, that is going to be a very difficult plug job. So we pulled the steel casing and sent it over to Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Buffalo yep. and smelt, smelted it again into steel to build tanks and missiles. All right. yep. So yep. in, in the wartime, that was one of the quickest places we could go to to get steel was to pull the old well casings. And we thought we were solving one problem and lo and behold, we created another. Yeah. And the plugging standard has gone up, you know, even even back then they did. They typically did some form of plugging and they would usually just shove something down into the hole, which didn't, didn't plug it to our standards today, obviously. And that, that makes it very difficult. You have to drill those out. So you have to drill back down to the attainable bottom. And, um, you know, that, that's very difficult, but yeah, that steel was much more valuable in World War II to go over and to, you know, to fight, you know, the Nazis or, or, you know, to win the war, you know, the, the scrapping effort was very broad. So I, I and it, it, you can follow a rule, 
you know, um, in the area that we're going to be doing a big plugging project uh, this year, where we have a couple of those wells that have endured that scrapping, it's very close to a forest road. And they, you know, the closer to the, the closer the wells are to the road, the, the less intact those wells are, you know, further away, they're more intact, they'll be easier up for us to plug, but they're, uh, yeah, closer to that road, they, a lot of, a lot of things walked away from those wells. Anything else? We're good. So um, I mentioned fishing. So when we're, we're fishing, anything that falls down the well, or if we have some kind of an obstruction and we try to grab onto that, we're doing this blind and we're doing it hundreds, if not thousands of feet deep. So we, we, you can see this pipe back here. This is good plugging string. And this is called an overshot. And all that does is it, goes down over the well or the, the tubing and it grabs onto that, you know, it latches on and then we pull it all back out. So a lot of times when you go fishing, you run all the way down a thousand feet, you know, it takes you a couple hours of very hard work. And then you run back out and you didn't catch anything. It's very disappointing when that happens. And that, that does happen. Our guys, they're very experienced. It's, you know, it's very subtle things they'll notice and they'll say, Oh, I think we got it. And they'll pull it back out. And sometimes it comes out in very, very small increments. So the, those are rods. That's for a part of the pumping mechanism. And as you can see, they're coming out in one to three foot sections. And here's some more deteriorated pipe that we pulled out of the well before we plugged it. Here are, um, you know, I mentioned the industry. You know, the industry is the ones that have all the tools and the required skill set to plug these wells. And this is uh, an operator in McKean County. And these are a lot of just homemade, um, you know, implements and tools for fishing or for spudding. So getting back down to the attainable bottom, very specialized tools. And if the conventional industry, you know, doesn't survive, we will lose that knowledge, we'll lose that expertise, and we'll lose those tools to time. And that's going to be bad for the entire Commonwealth. Here's, here's a picture of oil on the ground and oil in the stream. Um, Tyler, this, yes? Are all of these wells emitting methane? Um, no, uh, I've experienced some that are not. But uh, again, a lot of times the pipelines pulled apart. Um, and again, the methane that is getting released, you know, we're talking about, you know, th tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of wells, even if it was a little bit from each well, it's, you know, probably significant. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to show you a, a video here shortly. Um, I don't go around lighting up wells, but I will show you one that I lit on fire. Um, but yeah, the... In, in, in regards to what we are plugging in our area, these are mostly oil wells and they're old depleted wells and there's not a lot of methane coming from them, but there is of course some. But um, this was the volunteer job that we did with the US Forest Service and the DEP. And we had a lot of meetings standing right here discussing how we were gonna go about this. And Cameron took the lead on that and we plugged it with all the money out of our own pocket. Another question. Yes. In the cases where you have compromised casing in a well that is still moving oil, mm -hmm. is there any sort of investigation into a possible contamination plume after the well is plugged? Uh, I don't know of any. Maybe in more urban areas there would be. Um, a lot of the areas we're plugging are out in the middle of the national forest or out in the middle of private property. Um, so not a lot of investigation, um, you know, again, where my focus is finding them and plugging them, um, it would very, be very hard to investigate that. Um, I'm sure that there's been some, uh, but it would be hard to determine how much. I mean, you know, obviously, if you find it in your water well, yeah, you got a problem. But, uh, um, you know, for the most part, I don't think that's something that there's, there's nothing in that I do, at least. Um, here's a picture. I'm going to show you a video of this well. This is, this is a registered orphan well. Um, uh, again, this is 
something that will be on our plugging slate at some point, um, you know, as we chew through, you know, the wells that we, you know, we, we rank them. And a lot of times it's just wherever we're working, you know, we'll, we'll do a batch here, we'll do a batch there. And uh, we're doing as many as we can, but this is a someday plug well. And you can tell it's artesianing and there's undoubtedly some commingling that's going on here because there's lots of iron in the water. There's no visible oil here at this, um, but I'm sure there's methane. And uh, so I'll show you a video of this now. This would be a very difficult plug job with all that water right there. And that's all, that is all iron, that is not oil. And uh, another thing, uh, you, you probably are all, or some of you might be under the assumption that our oil is black in Pennsylvania, it is not. Um, we have no, we have very little, if no black oil here. And it's because we have paraffin based oil. And the oil that we have here is what they call the sweetest oil in the world. And it's the lowest sulfur content and it's got wax. If I had M&Ms here, um, they put paraffin wax in M&Ms. Um, that's a refined product out of our oil. Um, and our oil is yellow to blue to green, um, but most of it is yellow. And they call it yellow gold, I guess. Any other questions? I, again, I can't see them, I'm sorry. So no, not, here, not right now, I don't see Okay. Them. Here's, here's a little bit of methane release. Um, this, again, um, I don't go in the habit of lighting wells on fire, but here you go. So that's an orphan well, and obviously there is methane coming out of that. So there is methane release with this environmental problem we, we have here. Here's a picture of what the methane methane is what like 30 times stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is that right I, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah i would leave that the atmospheric scientist for that one <laughs> i think it's 30 <laughs> around 30. Yeah. I, I honestly i don't remember I don't, don't know out of the top of my head but it's uh, yeah could be could be yeah yeah I, yeah i mean I, my, like i said um Maybe it's Dr. B's influence, but my focus is on water. I worry about benzene and water. Um, but uh, this is what the island well, or the well that we volunteered to plug, this is what it looked like when we found it. So you can see this thing has been, was burping out oil for who knows how long. And um, that's why we put it on a high priority. And the DEP would, had no money for this. We went to them, we went to the EPA to plug this and no, they didn't have any money for it because they plug emergency wells. So wells that people find near their water well down near Pittsburgh or where they find it, you know, find a well in your basement. I mean, um, so, you know, it's those emergency close to population wells that they currently have money for. And again, you know, that is where we need to, we need to find plugging funds and we need to empower more people like us to plug these wells. Uh, we volunteered to plug this one. So here's a picture of some of the maps. These are farm line maps put out by the geologic survey in uh, I believe the 1960s. And they, they map these, and these are quite accurate. Um, I find them to be somewhere around 80%. Sometimes I find more wells, sometimes I find less wells. I get worried when I find less wells um, because that means that uh, timber operation or a road operation or something has made that well disappear. But again, it's not 100%. You know, these are where I start in the office. I take these, I look at these, and then I digitize them into my GIS system. And then I put them on my GPS and I go to those points as best as I can. I look for the surface, um, you know, the, the, the surface evidence, whether it's old casing or um, whatever, you know, whatever I find on the surface, pipelines. And, um, you know, I'll walk miles at a time and sometimes you find two, zero, and probably the most I ever found in one day would be something like 30 or 40 wells. So, um, and then I document them, I photograph them, I take the GPS point and I send an application into the Department of Environmental Protection because 
I did that work, it needs to be located, it needs to be put on. Unfortunately, there's a lot of burdens uh, where they have to do further investigation, make sure there's no one liable. But most of these wells, like I said, are legacy, very old wells. There's nobody liable for these wells. I want them found. And that's what I, that's, I focus a lot of time on that. So we're zooming into the island well, it's well 12. There's obviously a lot more wells on that lot to be plugged. So let me just mention a, a question in the chat. I know you're doing most of your work up in the national forest and it's in sparsely populated places. You mentioned mm -hmm. sometimes along roads. Yep. The question is, are they ever found near communities? Well, Tyler oh. and I have a mutual friend named Joe Biaglo and I'll try to get him to speak next year. But the answer is yes. And in fact, sometimes buildings are built on top of these old abandoned wells. And then they have not only a health concern, but they also can have an explosive risk with the vapors accumulating in the basements and things like confined that. Confined so, spaces, yeah. Yeah, confined spaces. So there are problems with these wells near communities, and we'll hear more about that next academic year. Yep. Yeah. And again, like I said, the DP isn't focused in our area to to plug these wells because it's not near population centers. You know, Pittsburgh saw a lot of historical drilling. And so they'll focus down there. Um, and, uh, you know, and Dr. B mentioned that we, we operate up here in the National Forest and uh, you probably wonder a little bit how we do that. Um, and I guess the best analogy is, well, it, it's private property that we're, uh, we're operating on in a lot of cases. Um, you know, we're trying to plug where we own oil, oil gas and mineral rights. And the best way to think about it is if it's a building and it's the National Forest, the National Forest owns the first two floors and we own the basement. And um, so we work in a cooperative nature with the National Forest and we plan with them. And then uh, we do volunteer projects like this one that we plugged uh, on the island well there. It's actually a confluence. I tried real hard to change the name because it was a confluence of two streams. It wasn't technically an island, but I, I was too late to the party on the naming of the well. <laughs> there it is again. There's a picture of it um, standing on the one side of the bank. And um, like I said, it was a very, very tight location. You know, right here is, you know, the bank of the stream is going right here. And then there's another stream on the other side, but there's Pokey again. We love Pokey. Pokey just got uh, taken out um, out to another job to rig up on and, and hopefully plug another or from abandoned well. That's what that cost us. That was all internal cost. Um, then we again, we got zero dollars for that. And I think that's really important. And that's something that every Pennsylvania citizen needs to understand we need to find ways to to generate funds to start plugging more wells or we're never going to solve this problem we're doing what we can as a company but uh you know there's only so much and <laughs> last year was tough we still plugged several wells last year but you know we also we also were an energy company we're producing oil and natural gas and i'm sure people were aware that we had a dip in oil price that was never been it has never occurred before. So, you know, the, the more money we make, the more wells we plug. Have you seen any um, info on the infrastructure plan that's in um, the house right now? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we, we've worked with uh, representatives on that. Um, you know, we, um, my father-in-law is a part of a crude advisory board called CDAC. And this is, this is a hot topic on CDAC. And um, we're trying to steer that to what I deem the most two important things, finding them and plugging them. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a speech, you know, giving a presentation to academics. And I think there's some money to study them, but the, the emphasis really needs to be on, uh, on finding them and plugging them. And, and, yeah, I thought that was going to be one of the emphasis of the, the infrastructure bill so, was, yes, was so, money for plugging wells. So far, I, I don't want to use a bad term, but it, so far it's it's been a little bit hijacked. It, it's been steered away from that. And 
And actually we should have something in, we should have some readily available funds in the Commonwealth right now in the, the form of the Marcellus Legacy Fund. And uh, that was to plug legacy wells, but uh, most 99.9% .9 of that money goes elsewhere. It doesn't go to plugging wells. And it's, that's very disappointing for our industry and our folks that are focused on plugging. So, but hopefully we can start to steer that in the right direction. And then that, that's one of my goals here today is to educate people. Um, you know, I, I'm from Warren, you know, I, I lived here now half my life. And uh, I didn't know how extensive this, this issue is because it's out in the middle of nowhere. People come up here to fish and, and to hunt, but they don't really understand the, the history and they don't know the scope of what's going on. Is there any other questions? I'm sorry, I still can't see them. No, good. Yep, you're so, good, Tyler. By the way, it's uh, it's twelve fifty two, so please don't be offended as you start to see the participants depart for their next class. But no, that's fine. I I actually timed that quite right. Um, so you know, again, we we my number one issue is to find them. Um, you know, we have not found them all. Um, and there's a lot of data to go through. If you look at the PADUP mapping website, which is a resource I use all the time, we still have found. We, <laughs> You know, let me show you this map again. We still haven't found that many wells in that area. You know, just you know, to give you just a glimpse. And this is this one township. I just showed you one township in Warren County. And of course, it's not like you know they they drilled oil wells where they found oil and where they found natural gas. So it's not like that across the landscape either. I don't want to put this out of proportion, but. You know, we know pretty much the areas and, uh, you know, we need to find them. And then, of course, we need to plug them, plug, 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 plug. You know, we can't plug fast enough, um, in my opinion, because every day that goes by, you don't know, you know, the well that you planned on plugging next week, you know, might have been better to plug it this week because you had a, you had some catastrophic failure, such as a tree hitting it. We have uh, the emerald ash borer here and our ash trees have died. And, you know, a tree hits that well smashes it down and that's just enough shock at the top of the well to you know to make, cause that deterioration to break and uh, now you're talking about doubling tripling quadrupling the plugging cost Heather, what does a student have to do what kind of major should they go into if they're interested in getting into this particular industry um well i think you know the, the mapping um you know the geosciences uh you know, definitely help. There's petroleum uh, to, you know, petroleum geology or, you know, petroleum engineering. I think Pitt Brad offers some form of petroleum technology. That's a very good one, um, you know, to, to get into this. Um, and, you know, our, our situation here in Pennsylvania is a little bit different than other states, even Ohio. Our, our fields are the oldest in the world. Um, so, you know, it, it is kind of a unique problem of the Commonwealth, but there's other you know, other do So, you know, but oil and gas is, you know, we have lots of oil and gas. It's, it's, it's a great resource, um, but we need to manage it. And a good way to manage it is to properly plug and abandon the wells. Um, any other uh, questions? How about from students? Or are they all gone? You were all my students today. It's true. It's true. Let me just do one more plug, which is that in field investigations in May, we're going to visit the Drake well up in Titusville. And that is a phenomenal facility okay. for helping people understand the black gold and the petroleum age. It's right where Wonderful. it got started. Yeah. 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 That, uh, yeah, that, that, that they have great resources there. There's a museum in, in Bradford. Um, actually, we're going to uh, someday we hope to have our own little museum here at our office. It's kind of a back burner. But yeah, we want to educate as many people about this as we can. And that's a great, great resource, just tremendous. Um, but, uh, you know, field investigations, you know, um, to your point, Dr. Snow, you know, to get into this, you know, best way is to put your boots on and then go look at these things. And to hike in the woods to know what it is to be prepared to go out in the woods all day every day 
Um, oh, I forgot to go to my slide. My companion that goes with me is on my last slide, and there she is. It's one of the benefits of my job is she comes to work with me every day, and that is Tundra. So Tundra comes with me every day. Nice, nice. Yeah. Listen, Tyler, I want to give you a round of applause and uh, hit you with some uh, reactions and uh, show you some love and thank you again for coming back to your alma mater and helping to inspire the students and inform them about the scope of a problem. Uh, because finals week are closing in on us, we will break cadence of having one of these talks every other week by having another talk next week. A professor from uh, Allegheny College is gonna come and speak to us about the hydrocarbon rich rocks underneath Pennsylvania. And then three weeks from now, we will be visited by another alum from our department who is a hydrologist and he has the prestigious position of being in the Colorado River Forecasting Office. So uh, we will continue with two more great talks this year and then we'll get a nice summer break. So thanks again, Tyler. We're gonna stop this recording and we will do what we can to get this to you and have your family look at it. And then we look forward to hearing from you about the possibility of YouTube. So I okay. gotta go. Tyler. I gotta, yep, yeah, thanks, nice buddy. Talking, yeah, nice to talk all, to all of you. And uh, you know, as uh, Dr. B always says, get in the van and go out and see these things. <laughs>